Hi everyone, I'm Leanne. And I'm Mike. And this is Unschooled History. While canids go back much further, the first real wolf, the Himalayan or Tibetan wolf, showed up approximately 250,000 years ago. Quite a long time. Yeah, it is. This was followed by the Indian wolf, approximately 120,000 years ago. This was followed by the megafauna wolf, not to be confused with the dire wolf, which was a type of megafauna wolf that was found south of Wisconsin, I believe? Yes. In subglacial during the Ice Age. Yeah. He appeared around 81,000 years ago. This particular wolf is now extinct, but he's the ancestor to all modern wolves and all domestic dogs. This is a Mexican gray wolf and her puppies. This Beautiful wolf and her litter, um, they live at the Endangered Wolf Center in Eureka, Missouri. And all Mexican gray wolves currently in the wild can trace their lineage back to the pack at the Endangered Wolf Center, which I think is kind of cool. Yes. And it just shows how important conservation efforts really are. Yeah. Because this particular species of wolf, this particular breed of wolf is endangered. Yeah, and the Wolf Center has been doing a lot. I've been trying to support them when I can. Yeah, the Wolf Center does amazing work. And you can go on their website. You can adopt individual wolves or foxes. They have fennec foxes. Yes. That are just so adorable. And as much trouble as they've been known to cause for farmers and ranchers out west, wolves really are a very integral part of our ecosystem. And yeah. I'm so glad that the Endangered Wolf Center is there to do the work that it does. Yes. This handsome fellow is a Siberian wolf, not to be confused with a Siberian husky. It is because Pontus Skoglund, a Swedish geneticist, found a 35,000-year-old Siberian wolf bone that we now believe that wolves were first domesticated somewhere between 27,000 and 40,000 years ago. And it wasn't just a bone either. They actually also found an almost perfectly preserved Siberian wolf head. I saw something about that, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of cool. And they are hoping to get DNA from it. Oh, wow. But how did we get to from the dangerous predator on the left to the cute, cuddly little thing on the right? Yeah. How did we domesticate dogs? By the way, this cute, cuddly little thing on the right is actually semi-famous. <laughs> he was actually designated as the world's cutest dog. I believe his name is Boo, isn't it? Yes, his name is Boo. And he really is... I don't know. The cute level is actually normal levels. He's pretty cute. I mean, if you if any of you are familiar with Normal from Garfield, yes, Normal is a kitten, but he's like the world's cutest kitten. Well, this is frighteningly approaching Normal levels. It, it, it's scary how cute little Boo is. You, it really is. I mean, he just kind of makes you want to smile and cuddle him, but at the same time... You want to mail him to Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Yeah. So it turns out we did not domesticate dogs. The evidence actually suggests that dogs domesticated themselves. Currently, scientists favor a theory known as survival of the friendliest. Interesting. Brian Hare, director of the Duke University Canine Cognition Center, notes that the friendliest of wolves gained an advantage and this prompted cuteness. This theory is supported by a Russian experiment in the domestication of foxes. 
the friendliest of the foxes were also the best at picking up on human social cues. And the, their features changed to become cuter as an unintended consequence. So what is the oldest known actual dog breed? Well, this is it. This is the Akita Inu from Japan. And this adorable creature first emerged as early as 8000 BC. Quite a long time ago. Yes, and it is named for the Akita province where it originated, which is the northernmost province on mainland, well, not mainland Japan, but the main island of Japan. These two breeds are also really old. Um, on the left, we have a Basenji, and on the right, we have an Afghan Hound. They emerged approximately 6,000 BC. On the left is an Alaskan Malamute, which is often... It's often confused with the Siberian Husky, but the Alaskan Malamute is, it's bigger than the, than the Siberian Husky and a little bit fluffier. Yes. And it was about 1000 BC that we got some of these super fluffy be breeds. Um, the one on the right is a Samoyed. Yes. You can always tell when there's a Samoyed in the area. Oh, yeah. Michael, how do you tell when there's a Samoyed in the area? White birds and squirrel's nests. Yes. Their fur is super soft, and it's popular with birds and squirrels for their nests. And they shed it constantly, don't they, hon? Oh, yeah. Um, Michael has actually been friends with a Samoyed. <laughs> Samoyed fur everywhere. They're also known as smiley dogs because they often appear to be smiling just like a human. The Samoyed is also the most expensive breed in the world. Yes. Running at $14,000 for an AKC registered purebred pup. That's why I don't own one. I just find people who do and pet the puppies. Yes. The cheapest dog in the world, of course, is the dog that you can pick up at your local pound. Yes. Michael and I are big on adopt, don't shop. Yeah. We are in a state that, unfortunately, is far too well known for puppy mills, which are horrible. They, yeah. they really are. You have these unscrupulous breeders... They keep the mother dogs in cages. Their dogs often have a lot of health problems. And it, it's just a terrible thing. It really is. So, yeah, we are big fans of Adopt, Don't Shop. But if you do really want a purebred show dog... Get from an AKC breeder. Yes, AKC is the American Kennel Club is very, very ca careful about who they license as breeders. And there are regular checks. And a reputable AKC licensed breeder is going to be very good about their breeding. They are going to be very carefully choosing breeding partners for the health of their dog. For the health of the litter, everything. And the price that you are going to pay from them is going to be really high, but it's going to be worth it because you know you're going to get a really, really healthy dog if you absolutely must have a purebred. Otherwise, if you're just looking for a fun companion, go to your local shelter. The pound, the shelter, rescue groups, they all have dogs that need loving homes. And... Sometimes there may be a local business that is covering all of the adoption fees. Yeah. We know that uh, one of the local shelters in our area often has fees waived for older dogs because one of the local businesses is covering the adoption fees. Not that you shouldn't be afraid to adopt a dog just because of an adoption fee. I mean, 
It's covering the shots. It's covering some food. It's covering the spaying or neutering. And unless you are intent on having your dog be an AKC show champion, please spay or neuter your, your pets. Yeah. It, it helps keep unwanted dogs off the streets and out of shelters. Both of the dogs that my husband and I have owned recently were dumped on the farm. They were dumped on my on land near my parents' farm. Uh, so they were free to us, but and we don't have pedigree. They don't have pedigrees. No. Some of your but we best love dogs, them. Some of your best dogs are high fifty seven mutts. Tell them about Captain. Captain was pra almost free. Yeah. Captain came from Texas. He was picked up in a tornado back in 2003. The May 2003 tornadoes. Yeah, he was uh, dropped and had a leg shattered. And a vet, um, a vet amputated, amputated the leg away. and took care of him and was looking for his owners. Nobody would come and claim him. And it was almost time for him to be put to sleep because nobody claimed him. And I came in and fell in love with him. They were calling him Hoppy. Yeah. That's not very original. And I fell in love with him. Named him Captain. Yeah, for Captain Edward Teach. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he had Captain when he and I met and started dating. And Captain was kind of his wingman. Yeah. Captain's the reason we're married. So bless you, Captain. We, we miss you. So this is the breed of dog that the Guinness Book of World Records certifies as the world's oldest breed. This is the Saluki, and even though the Guinness Book of World Records certifies the Saluki as the world's oldest breed, it actually only showed up around 329 BC. Sorry cats, these dogs were held just as sacred as our feline friends in ancient Egypt. They were considered the dog of royalty. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Egyptian god Ma'at is depicted as a Selkie. And it's also associated with a Anubis. A Saluki. Sorry. It's also associated with Anubis. Yes. Either Anubis is depicted as a jackal, the Salukis are often associated with his temples. And they were actually originally bred in Mesopotamia. But the Egyptians just fell in love with them. And I don't see why not, because look at the, the Selkie. Saluki. Sorry, guys. I've been into mythology lately. <laughs> um, look at the Saluki. He's handsome. He is absolutely handsome. So we've talked about the oldest breeds. Here are the two newest breeds recognized by the AKC. The AKC recognizes new breeds yearly. And already here in 2020, they've recognized two new breeds. On the left is the Dojo Argentino. Outlawed in the UK, New York City, and Colorado, the Dojo Argentino first emerged in 1928. Its primary ancestors are the Great Dane and the now extinct Cordobo Fighting Dog. On the right is a Barbette, a French water dog bred to help hunt waterfowl. Though not recognized by the AKC until 2020, the Barbette actually first emerged in the 16th century. It has actually influenced the French language because it was originally named for the French word for beard, but now it's popularized as a as part of a phrase that means very, very muddy. <laughs> I had been away. Yeah, really. Dog in the water all the time, it's going to get very, very muddy. <laughs> I mentioned the Dojo Argentino being banned in some areas. 
it's just the latest breed subjected to breed specific legislation or BSL. Other breeds commonly subjected to BSL include pit bulls and rottweilers. 52 countries have some form of BSL and 41 of them have it at the national level, which is a shame because they do nothing but reinforce negative stereotypes. Unfortunately true. In fact, I call it bullshit legislation. <laughs> <laughs> Same letters. Yeah. Dojo Argentinos are actually great working dogs for military, police, search and rescue, or even a service animals for people with disabilities. They're friendly to anyone they know, and good socialization early on is the key. Rottweilers are depicted horribly in movies and TV shows, but they're actually loyal, loving, calm, and confident. I've had one. You've had one? Yes. What was he like? She. She. What was she like? A little adult, but good. Her name was Happy. Her name was Happy? Awesome. Yeah. I've never met a bad Rottweiler. I've never met a mean one. She was fantastic. I've met a mean one, but it was because of the way it was bred and trained. Yeah. But... Training gen- and upraising plays a huge role. Happy was gentle, friendly. Didn't like car rides after hitting her head on a car going over a railroad track. I've never met a Dojo Argentino, but I bet I would love to meet one and pet one. <laughs> the Pitbull? That's not even the breed's real name. According to the AKC, they're properly called American Staffordshire Terriers. And they're actually quite friendly and mellow. And some have become quite famous, such as Petey from The Little Rascals. Yeah. And Sergeant Stubby, an Amstaff who, in World War I, captured an American spy and held him until the American soldiers he was with could get there. On the bottom is a Timber Shepherd. Yes. He's a cross between a timber wolf and a German shepherd. And Jed, a cross between a Vancouver Island wolf and an Alaskan Malamute, is also there on the bottom. You might recognize Jed as the star of the White Fang movies that came out in the 90s. And he's just so adorable. I love him. Now let's talk about designer dogs. Y'all, these things are not new, okay? There is evidence of specifically chosen crossbred dogs as far back as the 14th century. But this type of crossbreeding was done at the time only for working purposes. The modern designer dog was first bred in the late 20th century, and it started with poodles because poodles have a hypoallergenic coat. I did not know that. Yeah, it's true. Poodles have a hypoallergenic coat. They also make great hunting dogs. I know that. Learned that from Cy. Yeah, we learned that from Uncle Cy. If anybody here has watched, anybody watching this has seen Duck Dynasty, you probably know that Uncle Cy has a poodle as a hunting dog, especially for hunting Ducks. Ducks. And he doesn't give a care what anybody else thinks. That poodle does real good. Uh And that was actually their original intended purpose. But they have hypoallergenic coats. And the whole goal of designer dogs and crossbreeding the poodle with other dogs was to create a dog that was hypoallergenic like the poodle, but also had the desirable traits of the other dog. But the thing is, when you're crossbreeding, you can't always predict which traits are going to show up. The trademark of a designer dog, of course, is the portmanteau word that is its name, such as the Labradoodle, part Labrador, part Poodle, or the Chorky, part Chihuahua, part Yorkshire Terrier. And, of course, we can't forget the Chewini. It's not a portmanteau of Chihuahua and Dachshund, but Wiener Dog is a nickname for the Dachshund. Chewinis are also known as Dachwawas, 
which is the proper portmanteau, Mexican hot dogs, and German tacos. And this one is ours. His name is Whiskey. He is sweet. He is loving. He's not the brightest. He got kicked in the head by my parents' mule as a puppy. Again, he was one of those poor things that was dumped out in the farm area. He, he's just so sweet. We love him. He may not be the brightest, but he is... He's got a big heart. He's got a huge heart. He's just perfect for us. And you may be wondering about that smile. That's his Elvis grin. We call that his Elvis grin. Because it kind of looks like an Elvis grin. <laughs> it looks like he's saying, thank you. Thank you very much. Y'all, dogs are amazing. And they are not just companions. They are so much more. They're champions and athletes. They're cartoon characters and stars of stage and screen like Lassie. Yes. Or Rin Tin Tin. Yes. They work with people with disabilities. You have seeing eye dogs or a dog that helps out with seizures, a dog that's trained to help out with autism. I met a service dog once who is trained to pick things up for his handler. You have dogs that are up to heart attacks. We ha I, I've met dogs that are trained to alert a hard of hearing person to a knock on the door or a doorbell and that is just so awesome that they can be trained to do that and it takes years of training and a lot of money to get these dogs trained properly but they are so worth it and I love that it happens and then you have emotional support animals of course yes which are medically assigned dogs who are there to be supportive to somebody emotionally. Again, uh, people with autism greatly benefit from them. People with severe anxiety, people with depression. Yes. In fact, Whiskey is my emotional support dog. And they don't require the same amount of training. They don't have the same rights as actual service animals so it is do not confuse a service dog with a emotional support dog no they are not the same thing a actual service dog can go anywhere a that its handler can go there are not the same kind of freedoms with a emotional support dog for example, Whiskey is covered under the Housing Act. A landlord has to let me have an emotional support has to let an emotional support animal live there even if dogs are not normally allowed. And hotels and airlines have to allow them. But other than that, don't take your emotional support animal to a grocery store or to a restaurant. It's against the law, and it it's causes... It's against the health codes. It's against the health codes, it's against the law, and it's, it causes trouble for people with legitimate service animals. Yes, it does. And people, people are stupid, and they buy vests. They're selfish doing this, too. They buy vests, because you, you can buy service dog vests online. And so you have stupid, selfish people out there who buy these vests and put them on their untrained dog to be able to bring their dog in with them wherever they want. And so that causes issues for people who genuinely need service dogs and actually have the, have real trained service dogs. And you've also got people who get other animals which are not considered properly trained service animals. Yeah, I understand if you have a properly trained service miniature horse. I've seen them. Yeah. 
But come on, guys, peacocks. And I understand there are were at one time service monkeys, but lizards. No, I don't think that lizard is actually doing anything for you. Seriously, it might be good for you emotionally, but it's it's not a service animal. So guys, please, please, please don't do that. Aside from disabilities and emotional service animals, you have therapy dogs that work in hospitals. Yes. I think I've had advantage help from those when I was in hospital for a heart attack. Yeah, they're, um, one of the hospitals nearby actually has a team of therapy dogs. They are great for working with children who are in the hospital. Uh -huh. They are great at helping keeping a claustrophobic person calm if they have to have an MRI. They're sweet, they're loving, they're well-trained, they have handlers who know what they're doing, and the hospital does have specific rules about them. They perform search and rescue. Dogs are, are trained to perform search and rescue. They work with law enforcement, and they work with the military. They even do parachute jumps behind em enemy lines. With the military. They search out explosives. They search out drugs. They do. They're great. Dogs are amazing. I love them. And I don't know how anybody could not love them. Okay, this is the final slide. And um, this is Onyx. He was my buddy. He was... Michael's Issa, and he also had trained himself to alert to Michael's heart condition. Excuse us if we get a little bit emotional. We had to have him put to sleep very recently. Um, he had very aggressive cancer, and it was going into his brain. And our options were have him put to sleep or... Have him on fentanyl patches and starve to death. Yeah, he would have starved to death because it was making it impossible for him to eat. Obviously, we couldn't let him suffer, so we had him put gently to sleep. We were with him for his final moments. Yes, we were. We were petting him right up until the end, loving on him. Um, no, he's not missing a leg um, the his other front leg is actually under a pillow. This was the next to last picture that I took of him, and he's he's just very in a very laid back position right there. He's just comfortable. Yeah, and he was always sweet and loving, and we miss him. And he was the one that inspired us to do this week's episode. So. We love you, Onyx. We miss you, buddy. Thank you all for watching this. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. Please go into the video's description area and... Um, and go to our Facebook page and... Follow us on Facebook. And if you want to remember a loved past dog, go ahead and put them in the comments too. Yeah. Absolutely. And as always, if there's anything you want to know more about the history of, please, please feel free to leave that in the comments. So. Thank you and have a good day.